What advice would you give to your past self? And I think that I think that's really the trick to doing to making sure you retain things. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Pre-Med Podcast. I'm Simul Arshad and I'm a second year medical student at Akhtar Said Medical College, Rawalpindi. Today's episode will be all about Hurya's incredible journey to King Edward Medical University. Hurya, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Hurya Akbar. I'm a first year King Edward Medical University student and I gave the MDCAT last year in 2023 being uh, someone with an A-level background and someone who's from overseas. I was born and raised in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, and I've lived there for most of my life. I hadn't come to Pakistan very frequently except maybe once every two, one or two years. Um, I was, my school, the high school I graduated from was Elaine Junior School, and it had quite, it had quite a few Pakistanis there, so I was already familiar with MDK, I was familiar with the curriculum here in Pakistan as well, FSC, but I didn't really understand the whole gravity of what FSC actually was or what MDK actually was until my brother, who was two years older than me, gave MDK. And for him, it wasn't something we always knew that we were supposed to, that he was supposed to be a doctor. For me, I kind of, it was always kind of in my destiny to be a doctor because my father is also a doctor. He graduated from uh, Faisalabad, Faisalabad Medical University and he practiced as a GP here and then he became a specialist here. And when I was young, I would always, anytime I showed any sort of academic qualification in my studies, he would be like, oh, okay, you're perfect for being a doctor. So I'm not saying they pressured me to become a doctor. <laughs> But I kind of saw it as like, oh, if I'm not becoming a doctor, what else do I become? And obviously they opened other paths to me, like engineering or, no, actually it was just medicine and engineering. And I didn't like physics that much. So then I thought, okay, medicine should be fine. And honestly, I'm happy with medicine. I think because of uh, my father, I've learned to actually appreciate and like medicine. So that was in my case, in my brother's case, even he was like, what should I do? And he was comforted by the financial stability of being a doctor. So he decided to give MDCAT very late, actually, because for overseas students, it was a uh, MDCAT wasn't a requirement until 2021, where they changed the uh, the before you could give SAT two, but then the college boards continued SAT two in 2021, I think. So then all of a sudden, he realized I had to have to give MDCAT. And that was when I realized after giving MDCAT as well. So he went through quite a few trial and errors. He gave MDCAT three times to get into a government university. And because of his mistakes, because of everything that he learned, I learned as well. Or else I probably would be a repeater by now because as everyone knows, coming from an A-level background, especially if you don't know anything, especially if you don't know <clears throat> how to approach MDCAT, it's very, very difficult to get a government admission. And that's why I always, I really want, I like to help A-level students so they actually know what they're getting into. Most of them are really confused, even among like admitting universities. They're like, what's UHS? What's Zabmu? You know, so I I love explaining things to them so they can understand MDCAT a bit more. They can understand everything a bit more. I got three A-stars in A-levels and I got almost all A-stars in IGCSE. And obviously that's a really good, that's, Really good grade. That those are really good grades. If you want to get into King Edward Medical University and any other university, honestly, like all over the world. But even if you get a few grades, even if you get like a B or two, a C, even you can still get into medical universities in Pakistan. You know, it's people think that oh, just because uh, if you don't get all these stars, you basically can't get into even any government medical university. And that's absolutely not true. I've seen people who get like A's and B's get into government because their MDCAT scores are so good or because their SAT two scores are so good. So. You can polish up your MDCAT. People think it's really daunting. But honestly, if you're well prepared for it, if you know what you're getting into, I don't think it's as daunting as it can be. Yeah. So who do you like? I've also done A-levels, right? But I did my A-levels in Pakistan and you did yours in Dubai, right? So like, what what's the difference between like the A-levels in Pakistan and in Dubai? Like, is the grading different if you want to like give the md cut over here right like do you get any percentage cut or something because like yeah. in pakistan with the conversion like a big percentage is actually cut that's why yeah. people mostly prefer to do fsc over here as compared to a levels so i'm just wondering in dubai do you have more percentage cut as compared to pakistani students 
I think it's the other way around, actually. I think we have less percentage cut. Because uh, in IDCSE, because A-level is also A-level equivalency is also based on O-level equivalency, right? I think you're required to give eight subjects. Yeah. In, eight subjects in O-levels and then three in A-levels. We're required to give five subjects. We're required to give, to give physics as well. Like, we have that as a requirement. Yeah. You can't skip physics. But I'm guessing you skipped physics because you said that you didn't like no, no, it. No, I, I, had, I had to give physics. <laughs> You gave physics? When I realized that yeah, physics was a requirement in both. Yeah, yeah, it's a requirement in Pakistan as well. Yeah. So why didn't you just do your medicine over there in uh, Dubai? Because you had really good grades as well. Uh, medicine in Dubai is really, really expensive. Extremely expensive. Very expensive. So <laughs> Very is expensive. there no like, scholarships or anything? And there's there's scholarships, but it's only for local students. They don't give it to expats. Okay, so that's the reason you decided to give the MD card in Pakistan. Yeah. So Huria, when did you move to Pakistan? Uh, like permanently shifted, I think was December 18, uh, 2023. It was just a day before uh, college admission started. So I had to pack okay, everything. Okay, and you gave your MD card in Pakistan, right? No, no, I gave it abroad. I gave it in Dubai. Okay, you gave it abroad. Um, Did you give any other tests besides the MD card, like the NUMS or the AKU test? Yeah, I gave both AKU and NUMS also in Dubai. Okay, that's nice. I also gave them. and It was so difficult for me. Like, I'm... I gave yeah, everything in Pakistan. Like, I've done my O-levels and A-levels in Pakistan. But it was super difficult. So, like, how was it for you? Like, all three tests, if you had to compare them? Honestly, I didn't even study exclusively for NUMS. I kind of just said, oh, a good MD cat, like, oh, then whatever. I'm, I can do NUMS yeah. as well, you know? <laughs> I didn't study exclusively for NUMS at all. And I think that's why I didn't get a stellar score there. I got 89%, which, uh, if you know, it's that's not really good. Nothing, too. Apparently not. People scored like ninety six or something. So I didn't even reach the nineties. But it's fine. It's a, it's a good score. Not a yeah. not an amazing score. But then I learned the reason I didn't get such a good score was because I was doing past papers and MCQs the night before my test instead of revising notes and everything. And AKU, I passed the test. I also didn't study exclusively for the AKU test. I didn't study all those plant based topics that point and, and anything, anything that wasn't an MD cat I ignored it except math I studied sat to math a bit so I could you know at least do math a bit and AQ yeah what were the different resources that you used um for the tests did for you use AQ, the same resources for all three of the tests or no you use different resources for all three of the tests for NUMS and MD cat I kind of just thought of it as like one exam so I it was just the same resources for NUMS and yeah. MDK. For AKU, I did use some past paper questions. I did see some past paper questions that were specific to AKU. And I also studied math for, I studied math from the SAT books. So I also did some NUMS past papers, full NUMS past papers, but I honestly saw them as comparable to MDCAT questions. So I don't really consider, you know, a very exclusive thing. So I think I only studied very, very, very exclusively from MDCAT. That was like my main goal. Yeah. So um, because you're like an overseas student and you've also done A-levels, what were some of the challenges that you faced? I think obviously everyone knows as an A-level student, there are many topics that you don't cover in yeah. MDCAT. For example, the chemical coordination system and kingdom animalia, we absolutely didn't study. Absolutely. Done that. Exactly. And the skeletal system, bacteria, viruses, obviously we did a bit, but we didn't do as like the syllabus in MDCAT, like in FSC textbooks in general is much huger than A-level. So the syllabus was a problem. It was very big. So what do you um, think you could have done? And better to like improve your score maybe I mean 194 is a really big score but like say you wanted to improve it what do you think you could have done I think I focused a bit too much outside the box when like because I was really paranoid you know MDCAT is like has a reputation for being very unpredictable for taking like uh, questions from other boards as well and I think I kind of veered too far off into that thought that I started studying Punjab board really aggressively alongside the federal board and I think I kind of reduce my score but because the time I could have spent studying only federal board could have probably increased my my score because not even a single Punjab question came so at least now I know at least that federal has a more is a more stable kind of board when you give MDCAT compared to like SIN or Punjab because they're not they're known for having really hard papers federal yeah so I think that's a common mistake that everybody usually makes that they study from a lot of different books and then people yeah. usually end up getting confused because of that so we talked about the MD card test today if you were to go back in time what advice would you give to your past self I think I would tell myself to like I said not focus on other boards too much you know like I would also tell myself I'd like to take it easy I know that sounds counterintuitive but it's actually 
it, it should make sense. You're not supposed to drive yourself crazy studying for the MDCAT. It is an easy test. Just by looking at the questions, it's supposed to be easy. It looks easy, you know? It's just that you cram so much inside your head preparing for the worst that the worst never actually comes. It's a much easier experience giving the test if you know everything, you know? It, that's definitely true. So make sure you know everything that's relevant. You don't have to stray too off syllabus for the test. You don't have to study the entire topic if you think it's irrelevant. I think I didn't really listen to that advice when it was given to me. I thought like, no, you never know what's going to happen in an MDCAT. You never know what they're going to throw at us. Do you think a lot of students underperform because of this reason as well, that they get too stressed out and then they end up studying things that they don't even need to study? And because of that, they may lose focus. I think so. I think it also has a much larger reason to do with the fact that what they do study, they're, they're unable to retain it. You know, they study so much, so much stuff at once. It's hard to retain all of that stuff at once. I How did you retain, retain the information? Because that's something that I really struggled with as well, especially coming from the A-level background. Yeah, same. It's all conceptual learning and then you go into this MDK and it's all rote learning. So how did you deal with, you know, rote learning and memorizing things, retaining in, it? In the summer before MDK, like before my A-levels, right after AS levels, I decided, I, I knew I was going to give them like that, so I decided I'd be a bit more prepared. So I made a lot of notes. I made a lot of notes for the topics, you know, especially ones that I wasn't already familiar with giving the MDCAT. So I decided to make a lot of notes. And then, so when I started my MDCAT preparation for, you know, in real in 2023, I already had my notes prepared. So I didn't have to study from the textbooks too much. So when I started studying from the notes, I decided to make Anki flashcards alongside that. But basically, little bits of information that I would study from the flashcards, especially those that seemed questions that seemed really hard to me, that, that were all memorization. I studied that from flashcards. And the thing with Anki flashcards, I supposed to do it every single day. So that was how I retained it because I studied things from other topics almost every single day in the form of flashcards. So I made sure I wouldn't forget it, you know. And I think that I think that's really the trick to doing to making sure you retain things, doing things every single day or making sure you retain things every single day. Did you use any other techniques like mnemonics or yeah, anything yeah. else? I, I used mnemonics. I didn't, I obviously study like the popular mnemonics for Krebs cycle or, you know, glycolysis, things like that, but also made my own mnemonics kind of. I remember there was a, I think something you have to study for enzyme pH. So basically enzymes which function at which optimum pH. And you have to, yeah. I had to memorize the order. And I couldn't memorize the whole order. So I made my own mnemonic. It, it was, it's really, it's really weird. So I won't say it. <laughs> but I had to, I, I you made can my say own it. Mnemonic. It doesn't matter. You can say it. <laughs> <laughs> It's a really weird one. And then I think you also have to study the isomers. Not isomers, the... Um, what is it? The isomers? I don't no, remember. The number. I forgot everything. As soon as I was <laughs> done with the MDK, I was like, bye-bye, everything. <laughs> I think for elements, you have to study the amount of... I forgot the word. This isn't the word for me. I forgot the word. But you, have to, you have to study... Um, the amount of something but i basically uh made a mnemonic for that as well for example like cal has six pals so now i know like okay calcium when you make your own mnemonics i think that's more easier to remember that yeah. because you add that mm-hmm. funny yeah. element into it as well so yeah, you never yeah, get I, it. and when you make mnemonics for other people it's supposed to make sense to them and it's kind of hard making sense of a mnemonic to other people but you already know what's exactly. going on so it's completely easy yeah you know? Um, so like that was for your pre-med journey, right? Now that you're in med school, how do you find that? Not to scare anyone, but if you think MDCAT is hard, I think medical school is infinitely harder. Exactly. Everybody uh, usually says that when you come into med school, you don't have to study that much, but that's far from the truth. I think you have to study that's double, triple far. the amount that you used to study. Yeah. So how are you like coping in med school now? You know, how's it going for you? I'm not. I'm not so much as coping as just going through the motions. <laughs> I'm just studying for a test when it uh, when I have a test. I'm just I I, I can't study every day. It, it's just not in me, you know. It, it, this the schedule and everything. The burden is way too hard. So it's really hard adjusting. I live in a hostel. Do you live in hostel? Yeah, I live in hostel as well. Yeah. So, so like your family <laughs> hasn't shifted here, right? No, they haven't shifted. Yeah, I also live in the hostel, and it's honestly more tougher to study in the hostel. Than- and as compared to home exactly because like these so scholars can complain they, these scholars can complain about the commute and everything and I understand the commute is a big part but you can study in your own bedroom and you're on your own study table and you have yeah. no roommates and you have your mom's home cooked food i think exactly. i would take that over the commute every any single day 
same literally same so how many roommates do you have and i was really lucky i only got one roommate thankfully and the others have like three or four yeah no i get it so oh, who are you well. i have one as well and i got really oh, lucky good. too <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was the end of the podcast then, Huria. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experiences with us. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe, leave your comments and questions and check out Medangal's pre-med resources. Until next time, take care and keep striving for your dreams. Mm-hmm.